When my oldest son was about five, he asked me one of those important, life-changing, benchmark questions. No, it wasn't the where do babies come from question. I was actually ready for that. I had like diagrams and everything. What he asked me was, Dad, where do thoughts come from? Really? Really, kid? Is that what you want to know? So, I don't know. I, I just spit out something like, thoughts come from your head, son. And that kind of shut him up for a while. And now, about 10 years later, I guess he's finally ready to hear where thoughts really come from. So, here it goes. Now, I wasn't actually lying to my son. I mean, thoughts do come from our head. In particular, they come from our brain. To be even more specific, they come from these small cells in our brain called neurons. We have about 100 billion neurons in our head. And all these neurons have basically one single job. And that is to communicate with each other. It is vital to understand that every thought, every feeling, every emotion, every memory you've ever felt is because these billions of neurons are communicating with each other in different ways. What's important to know about these neurons is they never, ever touch each other, which was the motto of most of my girlfriends in high school. There is always a space or a gap between neurons, and this gap is called the synapse. So then how do our neurons actually communicate with each other across this gap? And the answer essentially is they throw chemicals back and forth at each other. And these chemicals are called neurotransmitters. And how important are these neurotransmitters? Well, I mean, if I was pressed, I would say they're everything. Every thought, every single memory, hell, every emotion you've ever had is because of specific chemicals or these neurotransmitters that are being shot across the synaptic gap between neurons in our brain. Okay, so how many different types of neurotransmitters do we have in our brain? Well, scientists estimate there's anywhere between 30 and 100, with about 10 of them handling 99% of the functions in our brain. But for the purposes of, I don't know, an intro psych class or AP class or an IB class, you really only have to know about, I don't know, I would say about four or five. So let's go through them quick. One important neurotransmitter is called acetylcholine. Good luck trying to spell that. So scientists just call it ACH for short. And this neurotransmitter is involved in voluntary motor movement and memory. So every time you move your body, you're actually firing acetylcholine in the synapse in between our neurons. I guess a good practical example would be something like the black widow spider. The venom from a black widow spider increases acetylcholine production in our brain to the point where we'll start seizing because we can't control all the voluntary muscle movement. Lack of acetylcholine has also been linked to diseases such as Alzheimer's. A second neurotransmitter you should probably be aware of is called dopamine. Dopamine is involved in things like motor movement and alertness. Um, drugs like cocaine increase dopamine levels in our body, making us feel very, I don't know what it really feels like, I've never taken cocaine, but they say energetic because it's a stimulant. Lack of dopamine has been linked to Parkinson's disease, and actually an overabundance of dopamine has been linked to schizophrenia. Another neurotransmitter you should be aware of is serotonin. Serotonin is involved in mood control. Lack of serotonin has been linked to clinical depression. So if you're taking an antidepressant like Paxil or Prozac or Zoloft, then logically you would know that that drug probably increases serotonin levels in the synaptic gaps in our brain. One of my favorite neurotransmitters is called endorphins. Endorphins are really dealing with pain control. For those of you who spend a lot of time exercising, in particular those of you who run long distances, your body will release endorphins in response to the pain. I believe they call that runner's high. I don't really know anything about that because running just sucks. Opiate drugs like heroin tend to mimic endorphin production in our brain. I guess we can do a couple more quick. Uh, we have norepinephrine, which is involved in alertness and arousal. Uh, lack of it has been also linked to depression. We also have one called GABA. Uh, GABA really deals with sleep issues. Those six are probably going to be the only ones you'll see on an intro to psych exam. So now you have kind of a conception of what a neurotransmitter is and what they can do. We still have to address how neurotransmitters actually get around our brain. In other words, how those neurons actually toss or throw or fire 
the neurotransmitters from one neuron to the next. And the best way to do that is to go over some neural anatomy, or the structure of a neuron. Let's start with the dendrites. The dendrites are like, they're like these root-like branches or these arms that come out of the cell body of, of a neuron. And they have basically one job. They're like, I don't know, they're like dirty old men. And what do dirty old men do? Yeah, they grab onto stuff. And dendrites grab onto stuff too. But in this case, they grab onto neurotransmitters. Their main job is basically to reach out, grab onto neurotransmitters from the synapse, and send messages to the rest of the neuron. Attached to the dendrites, you have the soma, or the cell body. It's basically like the brain of a neuron. Below the cell body, you have something called the axon. The axon is a wire-like structure that sends electrical messages from one side of the neuron all the way to the other. Surrounding the axon is a layer of fat called the myelin sheath. The myelin sheath, like a rubber around a wire, helps insulate the electrical signal traveling down the axon. When the myelin sheath breaks down, you have a disorder called multiple sclerosis. At the bottom of the axon, you have the terminal buttons. I've also heard it called axon terminal or end buttons. And the function of these terminal buttons is to store neurotransmitter that could be fired across the synapse to the dendrites on the next neuron. Okay, so how does this whole thing work? When a neuron's doing nothing, it's called resting potential, and it has a slightly negative charge. When the dendrites grab onto enough neurotransmitter, the neuron then will reach what we call a threshold. It's either going to fire or it's not going to fire. That concept is called the all or none response. Kind of like putting your finger on a trigger of a gun, the gun will either do nothing or a bullet fires completely. There's no halfway or partway firing. So when the neuron decides to fire, it goes into a process called action potential. And what happens basically is a little portal opens up on the axon and in rushes in positive ions, mixed in with the negative ions inside the axon, causing an electrical charge to travel down the axon. Now, in case you want to know, these ions can be many different things, but they're usually potassium and sodium, but I don't think it's all too important to know. An electrical charge travels down the axon until it gets the axon terminal, and the axon terminal buttons then fire off neurotransmitters across the synapse to the dendrites on the next neurons that are awaiting it. When the neurons receiving the neurotransmitter across synapse had enough, they reach their threshold and perhaps go into action potential. The axon terminal on the original neuron will then go into the synapse and suck up the leftover neurotransmitter and we call that process reuptake. I know that all sounds very complicated, so let's go through that one more time. So the dendrites grab onto these chemicals called neurotransmitters. It could be serotonin, it could be dopamine, whatever it is. When the dendrites had enough, it reaches its threshold. It then sends a message to the soma to go into action potential. When the neuron goes into action potential, it opens up a small portal on that wire called the axon. The axon lets in positive ions, causing an electrical charge to go all the way down the axon. Once the electrical charger reaches the axon terminal, that neuron then sends neurotransmitters across the synapse to the next neuron awaiting it. Whatever neurotransmitter is not being used, the axon terminal then suck it right back up in a process called reuptake. You know, I'm gonna take this time to give you guys a special bonus. We're gonna talk about drugs. Cause drugs for the most part mimic or block neurotransmitters in our body. In fact, drugs do only one of three things. Some drugs are what we call agonists. Agonists are drugs that mimic neurotransmitters. So they latch onto the neuron, the neuron thinks that that drug is a neurotransmitter, then it goes into action potential and it fires. Other drugs are called antagonists. Antagonists latch onto the neuron, the neuron knows it's not the neurotransmitter, and it stops a neuron from going into action potential and firing. The third thing a drug can do is it can inhibit reuptake. In other words, when the axon terminal tries to suck up that leftover neurotransmitter, some drugs block the axon terminal so it can't suck up that leftover neurotransmitter, leaving too much in the synapse, causing us to feel the effect of that drug. An example would be cocaine. Cocaine is a dopamine reuptake inhibitor. So when a neuron's firing dopamine, the axon terminal fires it out, 
and then it tries to reuptake it or suck it back up. The cocaine blocks the axon terminal from sucking up leftover dopamine, thus we have too much dopamine in the synapse, thus we get high of cocaine. In fact, almost every single antidepressant drug is a reuptake inhibitor. Uh, they're most often called SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Drugs like Paxil, Prozac, or Zoloft, they go into our body and they stop the axon terminal from sucking up the leftover serotonin. In this case, we raise serotonin levels in our body, hopefully alleviating depression. Okay, so there you have it. Neural anatomy, neural firing, neurotransmitters, and drugs in just a few minutes. Now, obviously, I really simplified this. There are very smart people spending their whole lives studying this electrochemical process called neural firing. But since the next season of The Walking Dead comes out soon, I gotta go binge watch. I don't have a lot of time, mostly because my wife's going to make me watch that show, This Is Us. I don't know. It, it's all right. It's, it makes me cry every time. Whatever. Some of you know what I'm talking about. All right. Later. Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this video, I'm going to talk about the brain, structure and function. Remember, structure is what it's made up of, and function is what does it do. We sometimes refer to this as the anatomy or structure and the physiology or the function. And so the cool thing is that we're going to go through 17 different structures in the brain, kind of lay out uh, the basic plan of the brain, but you're using your brain to process it. And if you do a good job when we get to the end and I review all the parts, you should be able to tell me what their structure is and what their function is. And so what type of organisms have brains? It's the animals. Animals use nerves, they have muscles to move around, and so they have to organize that movement and so they use a brain. And so if we look at the two basic body plans of animals, some are radially symmetrical. In other words, they're, they're built around almost a tire. And then some are bilaterally symmetrical. In other words, a tiger, you could draw a line right down the middle. There's going to be a clear right side and a left side. There's going to be a clear front and end. And as we became bilaterally symmetrical, we had to organize that movement. And so this is a simple animal body plan. And so this animal is going to move towards the right. And as it does so, it it has to take in information. We call that sensory information using neurons. And so right now you're taking in sensory information from your eyes, from your ears, and then inside your brain you're going to integrate that information. You're going to make sense of it and then you're going to figure out what you want to do, how you're going to act uh, dependent upon that. And so then we have this loop of motor neurons out or motor nerves. And so this loop in simple animals is also important in understanding how our brain works. But if we look at these real primitive brain, they, we find that they have a real common structure. They have these four humps and we call those the, well, the first one's not a hump, but the spinal cord. We then have the hindbrain, the midbrain, and then we finally have the forebrain. And we find this consistent throughout all animals. And if we look at something like a shark, it pretty much looks just like that primitive brain. You can see down here we've got the spinal cord that's bringing information in. We then have the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. And so one thing you should remember is that the closer we are to that spinal cord, um, the more basic the functions are. And so we're right down in this hindbrain, it's going to be um, basically keeping the heart beating, keep the circulation going, digestion in the shark. But when a shark decides to attack you or it has some kind of an emotional response, that's going to be way up here in the forebrain. Now if we look at you when you were really little, when you were an embryo, you had a brain that looked very similar. You had a spinal cord, you then had a hindbrain, you had a midbrain, and then you had a forebrain. But during development that, that brain changes radically. And so this is what an adult brain looks like. So we still see, see that spinal cord. We then have the hindbrain, we have the midbrain, but look how large that forebrain is going to be. And so that's where all of those emotions and memories and all of that thinking we, we generally attribute to the brain is going to be in the forebrain. And so let's get to the actual anatomy. And so there are going to be 17 parts that we're going to go through. So you should always be thinking, what's the name of the structure?
structure, uh, where is it, and then what's the function, what does it do? And so if we look at a basic brain plan, we find these four things jump out right away. We're going to see the brain stem. We then see a cerebellum on the back of the brain. So again, to get yourself uh, oriented right, the eyes are going to be right up here. And so this would be towards the back of the head. So that's going to be the cerebellum. We then have the area of the thalamus, hypothalamus. And then finally, we have the cerebrum, which is going to be that dominant upper portion of the brain. And so let's begin with the brain stem. The brain stem is broken down into three individual structures. So if we start at the bottom, we've got the medulla oblongata, the pons, and then we finally have the midbrain. And so those three things, medulla oblongata, pons, and midbrain, make up what we call the brain stem. So that's the structure. What's the function? Well, it really does two things. The first thing it's going to do are these more basic needs. It's going to keep your um, self-breathing, keep circulation going, digestion, swallowing. All of that is going to be controlled by the brain stem. If there's any damage to the brain stem, it's going to be catastrophic. Um, what else does it do? Then we have information coming in. So we have sensory information, just like that worm did, coming up to the brain. And then we have motor nerves going out. And so the brain stem is important in routing that information and filtering that information, sending it where it needs to go. What's behind that? We have the cerebellum. The cerebellum and the function of that is motor control. So as you do sports, for example, it's the cerebellum that's giving you that uh, coordination. And it also gives you motor memory. So as you learn to ride a bicycle and you remember how to ride a bicycle, that's going to be thanks to your cerebellum. If we keep moving up, we now have the thalamus. The thalamus, again, sits right on top of the brain stem. And so the best analogy I could come up with is a router. It's basically sorting data and sending it where it needs needs to go. If we were to look below that, there's a, a little structure here that's incredibly important. It's called the hypothalamus. That's going to be really right above the roof of your mouth. What is that accountable for? It's homeostasis. So it's maintaining uh, body temperature. It's maintaining osmolarity. All of that stuff is contained uh, right up in the hypothalamus. Also important in circadian rhythms. And then if we look right below that, you can see a little gland hanging out. And one half of that pituitary gland, the posterior pituitary, is technically part of the brain. And it's important in... Um, basically sending off hormones. And so there are nerves that flow into that pituitary and it's sending out things like antidiuretic hormone that keeps your water balance the same. Uh, oxytocin would be another important hormone that comes out of there. If we keep moving up, then we get to the level of the cerebrum. What's the function of the cerebrum? That's integration. So what we're doing is making sense of all that data that comes in. Now what makes up that cerebrum are going to be all these neurons. There's tons of neurons that are connected together. Billions of neurons and billions and billions of synapses or connections between these neurons. And that's where we're making sense of information as it comes in. Now if you were to look at this image right here, so of that brick wall. So take a moment to look at that and I'm going to show you some other images. Now focus on this. And then that, and then that. And what we find is as you look at those images, your brain is integrating. It's making sense of all that information. And it used to be a black box. We didn't know really what was going on. But now we can use technology like a functional MRI, a functional magnetic resonance imaging. And what we're looking at here is a brain in action. So this same study was done on females. And what they would show them is something neutral, like a brick wall, and then a kitten, and then something like dirt, and then something like puppies. And so what we're seeing is as as those images are switching back and forth, we can start to see where blood is flowing around in the brain and we can start to figure out what the different parts of the brain actually do. We're able to figure out their function. So when we're looking at the cerebrum, every picture that I've showed you is from the side, so the eyes up here. But if we were to rotate that 90 degrees, now we're looking at it head on, we'll find that there are two hemispheres. There's going to be a right and a left hemisphere. Now they're connected in the middle using something called the corpus callosum. So that's a connection of nerves in between the two hemispheres. And we do tend to show lateralization. There are going to be certain things that we put kind of on the left side of our brain, like mathematical reasoning and logic and things that we put on the right side, like facial recognition. Now this is plastic. In other words, we can move these functions back and forth. And you can even have a radical um, hemispherectomy where you're cutting one of these out and you still have a functioning brain.
Now, if we were to go right below the corpus callosum, we get into this area called the basal ganglia, and it's made up of a bunch of nuclei. What are nuclei, or what is a nucleus in a brain? It's basically a bunch of neurons that are right next to each other that have the same function. And so all of these nuclei together make up what's called the basal ganglia. And you can see this would be the corpus callosum connecting it together as well. So this is below the cerebral cortex. What's the function of that? Well, scientists have been able to figure out there's this, this complex interaction of inhibition and excitatory response between these neurons, and basically it controls a lot of our motor control. And if you have somebody who has Parkinson's disease, then we're having problems in this basal ganglia area. As we move farther up the brain, we eventually get to the cerebral cortex, and that's going to make up about 80% of the brain. So it's most of the brain itself, and it's broken apart into these four lobes. And so if we start in the front of the brain, we have what's called the frontal lobe. What's the function of that? It's mostly executive function, so it's kind of like uh, the boss of your brain. It's emotional control up there. And if we have people who have damage to that frontal lobe, they have really uh, huge emotional swings. As we move back towards the back of the brain, we get to the parietal. Uh, lobe. What's the function of that? It basically is sensation. It's you uh, dealing with and reacting to your environment. So we have a lot of neurons coming in here from uh, sensory input. As we move to the back, we have the occipital lobe. Uh, the function of that is vision, primarily vision. And then we move onto the side, we have what are called the temporal lobe. Temporal lobe is going to be important in language. It's important in hearing. It's also important in memory. We have a lot of memories in there. And so each of these lobes have different uh, functions that are associated with it and hopefully those little icons help you remember those functions. Now if we were to go inside the parietal zone we'd find a really uh, important part here it's called the somatosensory cortex and that's where sensory information is coming into the brain and then on the other side of the lobe we have what's called the motor cortex and so going way back to that worm we have information coming in sensory information and then we have motor output coming out and so that's going to be a point of integration where we get information in decide what we want to do with it and then send that message back out. Now if we to look at that somatosensory cortex and map it along the cerebral cortex, we would find that we dedicate huge amounts of that brain surface area to things like your fingers, your tongue, your lips. In other words, we have way more neurons and way more sensory information coming in from your fingers as opposed to, for example, your back. We don't have as much of it dedicated to that on the back side. We could also use functional MRIs and then even an operation to figure out where a lot of these things are located like speech and smell and hearing. But over the future, we're going to get really, really good at figuring out specifically what are all the different parts of the brain, what are the nuclei, what do they do, and even mapping it down to the level of the neuron. So how did you do? Do you remember those 17 different structures and their functions? Well, it's time to review. So let's go through it. What's this one at the bottom? Overall, we call that the brain stem. Hopefully you got that. Um, what are the three parts of the brain stem though? Do you remember that? Could you pause the video and then say what they are? Well starting from the bottom remember we have the medulla oblongata, we then have the pons, and then we have the midbrain. So that's going to be the structure and where it's found. Can you remember the two functions of the brain stem? Two big things were, number one is to maintain breathing, heart rate, uh, digestion, swallowing, so these fundamental properties of life. But what's the second one, remember, it's to sort information going up and down. Uh, what's behind that? What's that structure called? That is the cerebellum. And so what's the cerebellum do? Remember that's coordination, motor control, and also motor memory. Do you remember what sits right up above the brain stem? That is the thalamus. What's the thalamus do? Remember it sorts information as it moves up to the upper parts of the cerebrum. What's below that? That is the hypothalamus underneath that. What's that do? Remember that's homeostasis. It's maintaining that internal body state. Do you remember what hangs off the bottom of that? That is the posterior pituitary. Hopefully you're doing well so far. If we keep going then, what is this upper portion of the brain called? We call that the cerebrum. Okay, let's keep going into the cerebrum then. So do you remember what's that connection between the two hemispheres of the brain? We call that the corpus callosum. And do you remember what we call those little nuclei that are found below that uh, cerebrum? Those are called the basal ganglia, and they're really important in uh, motor control. And remember, the corpus callosum allows our hemispheres to connect. If we were to go up to the upper portion, what do we call this 
you know, highly folded upper portion of the cerebrum. That's called the cerebral cortex. Do you remember what the front lobe is called? That was pretty easy. That's called the frontal lobe. What about the yellow lobe right here? That's called the parietal lobe. Do you remember what they do? Frontal lobe, remember, is executive or boss-like functions. And then parietal is going to be sensation of the environment. What about at the end? Do you remember that? That's called the occipital. And then what about at the bottom? That's the temporal. Occipital, remember, is a location where we have vision. And then temporal is going to be more language, hearing, memories are there. Now there are two other parts in our lobe. So what do we call this area right here and then this area right here? Those are called the somatosensory cortex. Remember that takes in information, makes sense of it. And then we have the motor cortex, which is sending information out. So those are those 17 structures. If you don't remember them, you may want to watch the video again, maybe make some flashcards. But that's the brain and I hope that was helpful.